Thank you so much for, for inviting us to this. I'm very excited. Financial aid is my favorite topic, and I'm so excited to have you here to learn more about your opportunities in Washington State. My name is Christina Winstead, and I am the Assistant Director for Outreach with the Washington Student Achievement Council, and I work with the 12th Year Campaign. And I'm joined here by my amazing coworker, Sam. Hi, everyone. My name is Sam Washington. I'm a Program Associate with the Washington Student Achievement Council. Um, I help Christina with the 12th Year Campaign, and I also participate in the College Bound Scholarship Program here in Washington State. So today we're going to talk about, again, like I said, my favorite topic, financial aid. Um, before we get started, I want to tell you why this is my favorite topic. Financial aid is my favorite topic because it literally changed my life. So when I was in high school, I didn't apply for financial aid. I went to a financial aid night. Um, a friend of a friend's mom told us that we made too much money to get financial aid, and I listened to her. Uh, and so I applied to college and I worked three jobs my first quarter. And I failed miserably uh, at, at both work and at school. So for me, I was ready to drop out of school. I wasn't doing well. And I sat down at a computer next to the financial aid office and a financial aid officer came over and said, do you want me to help you apply for financial aid? And I told her, we're too rich. She said, you know what? The only way to know is to apply. How about I help you? She helped me for 30 minutes. That was it. And it changed the entire trajectory of my life. What it means for me now is that I have a career that I love every single day. I love helping students with financial aid. Um, it just happens to be the thing I love to do. And I want you to be able to find the funding you need so that you can find the thing that you love to do that earns you a livable wage. And part of that process today is going to be talking about and learning about financial aid and applying for aid your senior year and every year that you go to college. I want you to have the same opportunities I did. I want you to find what you love to do. Students, you're gonna be taking over this world soon. We are just borrowing it from you. We want you to have the pathways to the careers that you love so that you can run this place. And so I'm excited to talk to you about my favorite thing, financial aid. The Washington Student Achievement Council, the agency that we work for, uh, we work to advance educational opportunities as well as attainment in Washington. And we do this through policy and programs like the 12th Year Campaign, College Bound Scholarship, uh, and the Gear Up program. So today, what are we gonna learn? Uh, and this evening, we're gonna learn about what financial aid is, the types of aid that are available, when you should apply for financial aid, how to apply for aid, talk a little bit about scholarships too, because it's all part of that puzzle of funding school, and then help and resources for you. So what is financial aid? Financial aid is just simply money to help you pay for school. And in Washington State, we have a lot of funding options. And it can be kind of confusing. We want to make sure you maximize everything, because all these different types of aid will help make school more affordable. And in Washington State, it also can be applied to approved apprenticeships. So there's a lot of opportunities to fund your pathway, whatever your post-secondary pathway is. When we talk about financial aid, I like to look at it as an umbrella. Now I know, in Washington, we don't use a lot of umbrellas. We're all about jackets with hoods over top, totally fine. But for financial aid, I love umbrellas because it helps us understand the topic and all the things that go with it. So financial aid really covers grants, scholarships, loans, and work study. Grants, and we'll talk more about these. These are income-based scholarships. We're gonna talk more about if this is something that you are going to be applying for separate from your financial aid. There's a lot of scholarships out there. And you know what the truth is? Last year, there were quite a few that went unawarded, which means no one applied for the funds. We want you to be the student that applies for, for the scholarships and for financial aid. We'll also talk about loans. And then one of my favorites, work study. So grants, grants are gift aid. So when you hear about aid, you're gonna hear about loans and gift aid. Gift aid is based upon financial need. And so typically these are funds that you don't have to pay back unless you don't meet what's called satisfactory academic progress. And that's just big fancy words for not meeting certain uh, levels of academic attainment. Um, or for example, I had a student when I was teaching at a community college that the student showed up the first day of school and they had me sign their financial aid paperwork that they're attending this class, awesome. End of the, the quarter comes, and I'm talking like they showed up after finals. So like literally 45 minutes after finals, I got a knock, knock, knock at my door. Hey, Ms. Winstead, I want to get some more of that financial aid money. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know who you are. I, I, I don't know if we've met. Oh, yeah, no, I'm in your class. Oh, you are? Because I just gave finals, and I, haven't, I don't think I've seen you. Oh, no, I showed up on the first day. But you know what? Me and my friends got financial aid, so we went to Vegas and spent the money, and we just decided not to come back to school until we get more financial aid. Yikes. For that student, she didn't attend her classes, she didn't withdraw from her classes, and she used the money not to pay for school and other things, but to go to Vegas. So financial aid is, uh, in that case, 
something that they had to pay back, their gift aid. Um, and so for that student, you know, I always encourage you, financially it's amazing for going to school, but not for Vegas. Um, the other grants that you're gonna see and we're gonna talk about today, the Washington College Grant. Uh, I love this grant because it is new opportunities for more students going towards more programs at more income levels. You'll also find that you may receive something like the Pell Grant. Okay, scholarships are gifts. So you don't have to pay these back. These are gifts from either independent organizations, colleges, they can come from so many different places. Sometimes it's just one time that they give you money. Other times there are scholarships that are called renewable scholarships that they allow you to renew for multiple years in a row. We have a wonderful tool uh, with Washington called the washboard.org. This tool is where you create an account and it matches you to the scholarships that you're eligible for. So it's a great place to start looking for scholarships. I also encourage you to apply for foundation scholarships from the colleges that you have uh, applied to for admissions. Okay, loans. This is real talk when it comes to loans. Loans are funds you have to pay back when you borrow them. So unlike grants, you're gonna be paying back these funds. When you receive an award letter from your school, that's the school's offer of how much they can provide funding for you based upon state and federal funds. Loans may be a part of that package. They may be a large part of that package. When you're looking at loans, I encourage you to think about not what you want in college, but what do you need? Because they're gonna provide you with loans that you can potentially turn down partial amounts of. So for me, when I was in college, and I've seen other students happen to, they'll have loans and go, oh my gosh, this is the first time I've had money. This is awesome. I would take all the loans. So easy to spend the money, but man, it's so hard to pay it back sometimes. So you want to make sure you're taking out what you need, but not typically what you want. Uh, my whole goal for you as students is that you will find all the funding and all these different pieces of that puzzle under the umbrella that will help you pay for school so you can reduce your loans to the smallest amount possible. When you're offered loans, you'll be offered two types of loans typically, and they are um, unsubsidized and subsidized. So unsubsidized loans are loans that the minute you take out that loan, the interest, the percentage of the amount that you have to start paying back, that starts accruing every month beyond the amount that you've taken out. Subsidized loans, when you take out your student loan, what will happen is they will subsidize the interest on your loan while you're in school and for a short period after you graduate. The thing I've heard from students, and this scares me, and so I want to make sure that the cautionary tale is that I'll just take out loans and I'll go into bankruptcy. Student loans are very difficult and at times impossible to, to discharge in bankruptcy. So you have to be willing to pay the amounts. There are other programs that can help with um, loan forgiveness, but you want to make sure when you're taking out loans that that's part of the calculation you're looking at what you'll have to pay back. Okay. Remember how I said work study is one of my favorite things? It's because I got to do this. And all my friends uh, that have gone to college, a lot of them have had these opportunities too. I know the two words, work and study together, sound like a real bummer, promise me. It's not. What it is, is an actual opportunity on campus to work, and sometimes off campus, to work in a different department, sometimes towards the field you're going towards, to earn money to help pay for school. So there are some really cool jobs. Like, I am a big old dork, so library jobs, awesome. Student life, amazing. Uh, you can work sometimes at the computer lab. I've had students who worked in the fitness center or been tutors. Uh, when I worked in outreach, I actually had several students that I employed under the work study program. The thing about work study that I love so much is for me, I was working in the mall. I had three jobs. Like I said before, I worked at, uh, I was a sandwich artist, which some of y'all, that's, that's code for Subway, my sandwich artist out there. We all, we all know each other. I see you. Um, we, I also worked at the Swiss pretzel, the twist you can't resist, but you know what? Y'all cook because it went out of business while I was standing there. And I did some BOGO action at Payless. So sometimes when I had finals, midterms, class sometimes, if someone didn't show up to one of those jobs, they would try to call me in. Hey, so-and-so didn't show up for their shift but I've got like a chem final today. Hmm. Well, do you want to make money or do you not want to have the shift? And so it put me in these positions where I'd have to decide between working or going to school. When I was in work study, my first uh, quarter that I was there, finals came up and I thought, oh, I've got so much work I have to do plus finals. And my uh, supervisor said, Christina, you know what? It looks like it's finals right now and you've got a lot to do. Do you want to take part of this week off so you can focus on your studies and then maybe just uh, work a little bit more of a break? It was the first time where a workplace said, we support you. We see that you're a student first and foremost. And in this world of work, we're gonna support you in that. It was amazing. So they know you're a student first and foremost and they're wonderful opportunities. Okay, I talked about scholarships already, but the other piece with scholarships I forgot to mention is that you're gonna find scholarships that may not be actual scholarships. So here's your red flags. 
if your scholarship is asking you to pay money, you are providing a scholarship to some random person. And it's not a scholarship. It means that potentially uh, you might be getting scammed. If they are ever trying to uh, charge you money for a scholarship uh, or to apply for the FOSPA or WAFSA, you are either on the wrong site or it's not the correct, uh, it's not an actual scholarship. So I encourage you to caution whenever you see uh, people trying to charge money for these processes. Okay, so all this money I've talked about, where does it come from? So there are four main uh, places that your financial aid come from. The federal government, state government, the colleges themselves and organizations, and typically the communities where the colleges reside, as well as around the state, the nation. So for federal funds, uh, this is funds that can be used in most schools that are qualified for financial aid. State funds can only be used at the state uh, that, that you're the resident of. So if you're a Washington state resident, then you can uh, qualify typically for Washington financial aid, for state aid. The colleges will t uh, sometimes offer funds to students uh, based upon going to that school specifically. So there might be some scholarships or other types of funding that we can provide you uh, based upon you attending that institution specifically. And these are typically institutional funds. And sometimes they may ask you to do an additional financial aid piece called a CSS profile in order to be able to be considered for some of those non-federal or state funds. And then organizations, different, I mean, there's so many organizations offering scholarships. There are scholarships for people who are left-handed. There are scholarships for people who make a duct tape dress. And, and, a, and I know that sounds like, oh, that's not gonna be pretty. Look it up, the duct tape scholarship. Some of those dresses are amazing. You make a dress and a tux and you submit them for the scholarship. There's a zombie survival scholarship for all you that love uh, The Walking Dead. You just write an essay on what you do uh, to survive the zombie apocalypse. Uh, and we actually have a worksheet for you to do where you can read our essays that we wrote. They are good and bad. And you can actually be the scholarship ranker to see what scholarships are looking for and how they grade kind of on a rubric. Most important things uh, with outside organizations is making sure you're meeting the deadlines and reading through their applications thoroughly. So when we talk about federal aid, these are the four main types of federal aid that you may be offered. There's the Pell Grant, there's that work study program that I talked about, those unsubsidized and subsidized loans, and then there's parent loans. So those are the main types of funding that they may offer you when you apply for the FOSPA. When you apply for the FOSPA, you'll also be considered for state financial aid. If you don't qualify for the FAFSA, you may qualify for the Washington Application for State Financial Aid, the WAFSA. And this includes types of funding like the Washington College Grant. And for those of you who maybe received what was called the State Need Grant uh, back in the day a couple years ago, this is the new and improved version of the State Need Grant. That's why I love it so much because the State Need Grant literally changed my life. Uh, College-bound scholarships. Some of you may be college-bound scholarship students uh, that you signed up for this in middle school. And now this is where that benefit's really paying off. There's our state work study program, passport to careers for youth and care, and our opportunity grant. And these are all parts of our opportunity pathways. So that Washington College Grant, it is new. So if you are graduating here in the class of 2021, you are the third class that's able to receive this new Washington College Grant. And what it has done is it has expanded the amount of income that you can have and still receive what we call gift aid, those grants, but it's also expanded these funds to approved 18 month apprenticeships. You can use these uh, funds at two-year schools, four-year schools. Uh, you can use them at those apprenticeships. If you're going into a technical program or a transfer program, whatever your pathway is, there's a lot of flexibility with this new grant. For example, a family of four making around 50,000 or less a year is gonna receive a full tuition award. And partial grants are available for families of four who make around 97,000 a year. So it's really increased that partial grant component. Again, the only way you'll know to what you're gonna receive is to apply for financial aid. So the college-bound scholarship. You may be thinking, wait, I think I signed up for this in middle school. If you don't remember what you did in middle school, totally fine. You can always check with your counselor to see if you are um, uh, someone who has signed up for the college-bound scholarship. It's an early commitment of state financial aid for students who apply in seventh or eighth grade. And the cool thing about this is it combines with other state aid to help cover the cost of tuition at the highest public rate. So University of Washington and Wazoo research-based tuition rates, they cover that, uh, plus uh, a small book allowance and some fees. And so that's the commitment of funds and it can be used at over 60 schools in Washington State, two-year schools, four-year schools, public and private. If you're going to a private college, you'll notice I said that it covers the highest rate of public tuition. So there is a difference between public tuition and private school tuition. And some of those schools, those private schools, have these awesome scholarships to help cover that gap for college-bound students. So you want to make 
sure you're checking with the colleges you're applying to to see how you can utilize your college bound scholarship. Eligibility, like I said, is a two step process. So step one, if you didn't do it, that's okay. Um, there's other types of aid, but you can't, unless you have like a DeLorean or a time turner from Harry Potter, you're not gonna be able to complete step one unless you're in middle school right now. And if you're here and you are a middle school student, awesome. This is something you wanna make sure you sign up for. Uh, but you sign up in middle school and then that step two is fulfilling the college bound pledge, meeting the income requirements and you do that, uh, they assess that through your financial aid application and they need to be accepted to and attend an eligible college within one year of graduation. You have five years to use four years of funding. Okay, so I talked about the FOSP and the WAFSA and you're like, wait, do I have to do two applications? No, there's a rule of one. You only want to do one financial aid application. You either do the FOSPA or the WAFSA. It's not about uh, which application you think you should do. You should want to assess yourself to make sure you're doing the correct one. So if your friend is doing one application, doesn't mean that you're going to do that one. You're going to make sure you do the correct one. The FOSPA is for students uh, typically who have a social security number, uh, permanent residency, or from a freely associated state like Marshall Islands. The WAFSA is for students that don't qualify for the FOSPA, but may qualify for state funding by being a Washington state resident and meeting House Bill 1079 requirements. And so the really cool thing is if you're not sure which one to do, you're like, oh, I don't know which application to do, don't worry. You can go to readysetgrad.org forward slash WASA and you can assess yourself to see which application you should do. Uh, it's just making sure you do the correct one. The FOSPA covers federal and state funding and the WASA is just for state funding. No matter which application you do, they both open October 1st. So you're gonna apply for financial aid every single year that you go to college. The easy way to remember this is um, when it gets all pumpkin spice and everything nice out there, also think, hmm, financial aid time. This is why I love October. October starts with the opening of financial aid. So it's literally the government saying, here, take some financial aid money for school. And this month also ends with you being able to go to a stranger's house, knock on the door and get candy. Pretty awesome. So that's why it's also my favorite month. If you are a senior, I know things come up really quickly. And I just wanna encourage you, we have workbooks that walk you through the timeline, but really right now you wanna start firming up those, those uh, uh, colleges that you wanna to go to. This is a great time with the PNAC Act Fair to talk to colleges and see which ones are gonna be a good fit for you. Did you know that you can apply for like 10 schools on your financial applications? So your fast for a walk, so you can put 10 schools on there. So you're gonna list every school you're interested in to make sure that they have access to your financial information so that that can be sent over so they can be considered for aid. Uh, you're going to be using the 2021-2022 application. So when you log in for financial aid, you want to make sure you use the correct application. You're going to be applying for financial aid for the year that you're going to college. And I know that 2021-2022 seems super futuristic, but it's literally one year from now, and that's when you'll be going to school. If you do the wrong year application, no problem. You can always go back in, and you can do a renewal for the 21-22 application. So what you want to make sure you do is this is all financial aid. At the same time, you want to apply for admissions. So you can apply for all the funds in the world, but if you don't follow up with an admissions application, they can't award you funds. So you have to apply to your colleges too. I know, it's super busy this fall, um, but I promise the payoff is awesome in the spring. So you want to make sure that if any of your colleges or anyone connects with you, that you respond back to financial aid offices and you make sure also at all times applying for scholarships. So you're going to be applying for admissions this next couple months. You're going to be responding back to the colleges and then you're going to receive what's called an award letter. So the schools are going to let you know if you've been offered admissions to a school, they will also let you know uh, uh, what aid they can provide you through an award letter. You're going to take a look at those award letters because they're part of the college admissions process. You want to make sure you're looking at like who's providing me this money, how much debt may I have if I go to this school, what's a good fit for me. And it's about thinking about what's a good fit for you as an individual, not where your friend's going, maybe not where your parents went, but where you want to go. What has your major? Do you want to go to a big school, small school, in an urban area, in a rural area? Look at all those things to make sure it's the best fit for you as an individual. And then typically you're going to make a decision on which college you want to go to on May 1st, so what we call decision day. So for the FOSFA, there's three ways to apply. You can apply through the website, through the app, or through paper applications. I highly encourage you to use websites uh, or the app 
The paper applications takes longer to process, uh, but it's a great application. I use this a lot when working with incarcerated youth. If you are uh, working with or helping incarcerated youth, please feel free to reach out to me. I have um, really cool college access care packages that I'm happy to send out that have all these materials that are in a format that is allowed to be sent to the different correctional high schools. It is actually one of those things I love to do, so please feel free to reach out to me if that's the case or if you're interested uh, in receiving those materials for students you're serving. So the website, uh, you can log right in using your FSA ID, and we'll talk about that in a second. The phone app, you have to actually download the app and make sure that you update that app if you've already downloaded it. So if you downloaded it last year because you wanted to see what it looked like and you haven't updated it since then, you'll want to update it so you can see the 2021-2022 application. A little quick tip, if you're on the website and you see um, something pop up that says you've encountered an error on FAFSA on the web uh, and it won't let you continue through, sometimes maybe the site's having some issues, Typically when the site's having issues, the phone app is still working. So if you're struggling with getting access, uh, maybe from the device that you're using or other issues, try on your phone. There are two language options for the FOSPA as well. So you can uh, use the application in either English or Spanish. And this is just what the website looks like. So your first step to applying for financial aid is to do your FSA ID. And what that is, is just you creating a username. Basically, you're saying, hey, Uncle Sam, I'm going to college next year, but I need you to pony up some of this cash. And so what you do is you're going to create a login using your uh, general information and your social security number so that you can sign into your application, so you can sign your application itself, and you can also go in and uh, be able to use it for the next year. You're going to use your FSA ID every year that you apply for financial aid. So people ask, wait, if I have to create one, do my parents have to create one? So some students will be considered independent and won't need to have parent information, but most students are considered independent for financial aid purposes. I know that you are an independent human uh, who is autonomous, but for financial aid purposes, until you're 24, they typically will consider you uh, dependent. There are some situations, like if you've been in foster care after the age of 13, if you have making a vento determination, um, if you're in a legal guardianship, things like that, where they will actually consider you independent, but most students are gonna need parent information to complete the process of financial aid. Your parent may need to create an FSA ID. Now, here's the thing. Uh, it's going to ask you on the FSA ID for a social security number. If your parent doesn't have a social security number, no problem. Don't worry. They're not going to create an FSA ID. They're going to paper sign the application and they'll send in their signature page. So the FAFSA it doesn't matter, uh, it only matters with the student's uh, citizenship status. They don't look at anyone else's status in that process. So the student and the parent um, will have different FSA IDs. So if your parent is able to receive an FSA ID, they're gonna use something different than yours. They're gonna use their own email address uh, and they will use that to sign your application. So if you are trying to figure out, hmm, which application should I do? This is where you're gonna go. You're gonna assess yourself for the WASPA. The WASPA is our other application for financial aid for state financial aid. And the applications are very similar. And instead of an FSA ID, you'll create a WAFSA account. So this is just you creating your account so that you can get your WAFSA ID number. You'll be using that WAFSA ID number every single year to apply for financial aid through the WAFSA. Okay, again, when does it open? October 1st. I want you all to think pumpkin spice and everything nice. As soon as that happens, it's time to start looking for financial aid. Uh, if you've hit Halloween, uh, and you've got your free candy from random people, it's also time to think about financial aid. So I encourage you, to apply early to maximize all the opportunities available. So there's gonna be a deadline for your school's financial aid application. And that's the deadline where it's completed and they've received any of the supplemental information they need. So you wanna make sure when a school says, hey, our application's due on the 15th, in your mind, you wanna think two weeks ahead at least so that you can make sure to respond to any requests that they have about your application. So try to submit your applications early. That way you can catch any errors. Uh, that class of 2021, you guys are seniors now, congratulations. Uh, make sure you're completing that 2021, 2022 FOSPRO WASA. You're gonna be using your 2019 income information. So common errors, these are the most common errors I see. You wanna use your legal information in this process. So this is the first time that you may be completing a, a federal or state document. And so if you're using the FOSPRO, you wanna make sure you're using your name as listed on your social security card. Uh, and don't make up any of those numbers. If you don't know your SOCH, 
I would pause, wait, and get your social so that you have it correct. These are things that you want to make sure that you're adding them um, correctly. So if you're, um, if you go by a nickname, but your social security card has a different name, you're going to use what's on the social security card. Uh, the next most common error is doing the incorrect year application for financial aid. That students will fill out the application for financial aid for the year that they're in high school, but not for the year that they're going to college. So you just want to make sure you're doing the correct year application, using the correct tax information for the correct year, actually submitting your application. So I've had students that will get all the way to the end, the signature part, they think they're done, but they never hit submit. So making sure you put, uh, that you actually get all the way through and receive an email that's a confirmation uh, from the FOSFOR WAFSA, letting you know that you've completed the application. And then finally, parents' information. And so this is including like, uh, if your parent doesn't have a social security number, they're just gonna put zeros in instead, making sure that you do that. Uh, making sure that you have accurate information on your parents. Uh, and if you don't have any relationship with your parents, you're like, oh my gosh, we're asking for a lot of parent stuff. There are special circumstances where they will not um, ask for parent information. They will reassess you to see if you're considered uh, independent instead of dependent. The other one, I hate to mention it, but they're going to ask you in this application your marital status. And it only gives you a couple options. You're either married, single, or widowed, divorced. Now, you may be in a relationship where marriage is the ultimate goal. Awesome, congratulations, we are excited for you, but for financial aid purposes, you're gonna have to check that single box. I know, doesn't sound so much fun, but there is no option for anything else. It's either singled, married, or divorced, widowed. Uh, so it's not about your aspirational plans, it's about where you are right now. So unless you put a ring on it and married it, you're gonna put down single. I had several students do that this year. Okay, so special circumstances. I've talked a lot about 2019 income information. We're like, whew, 2019, that was years ago. Um, we know that financial circumstances have changed. We know that COVID has greatly impacted uh, families all across the nation and that this may change the financial aid that you're eligible for because what you made in 2019 may not be what your family is making right now. If you've experienced a decrease in income, specifically uh, due to layoffs, anything where you have a significant decrease, you want to make sure that you fill out your application for financial aid using that 2019 information. And then you're going to connect with the financial aid office at the college you're going to go to to let them know that there's been a change in your circumstances so that they can assess you based upon your current financial situation and not 2019. There's a really cool tool called Swift Student that I'm going to show you that will help you assess those appeals. So it, it's a template where it asks you questions. Oh my goodness. And then it creates this awesome letter for your financial aid office with supporting documentation that you can attach to it that lets them know that your income circumstances have changed. And so this really cool uh, tool, it doesn't use your information for third parties or anything like that. It just helps, doing, uh, helps you with templates. And so these are all the types of appeals they can help with. So um, specifically the ones I'm, I'm really excited about is that income change, but also asking financial aid offices to exclude parental information uh, when there's a special circumstance. So they can help with any of these tools here to help you write a compelling letter to your financial aid office um, that really addresses what they need to make a determination uh, for an adjustment. So another thing you may experience is verification. When you apply for financial aid, one third of you will be picked for verification. It is a standard practice that is random, but they also use it to clarify information. So what happens is you may be asked to provide additional information about uh, your finances, specifically verifying your income, uh, typically through what's called a tax transcript. Uh, like I said, it could be also used to clarify information. So I had a student a couple years ago, well, it's actually last year, see it's been a long year. Um, last year the student went and put in their application, their parents listed their income at 32,000 a year. And the student was like, hey, if my parents make that, we all make that because we're a family. So the student also listed their income as 32,000 a year. Now, sounds pretty awesome, 18, 32,000 a year. So the financial aid officer went, that's odd. This 18 year old made 32,000 a year. I'm in the wrong job. I need to figure out what's going on. And so they selected the student for verification and said, we just need to see the, that you, we see that you didn't file taxes, but you made 32,000 last year. No, I, I didn't. My parents did. Oh, so they clarified the information with the student and they were able to adjust the income on the financial aid application to the correct amount. So no matter why you're picked for verification, you have to complete the process in order to be eligible and receive that aid. So you want to make sure if any of your schools send a request for additional information, whether it's an email, they, will, they send you something to your portal, uh, an actual physical letter, I don't care if they send you a pigeon, however they contact you, you have to follow up. Uh, if you uh, 
uh, forget that you've been selected for this process. You've still been selected and you have to finish up that process in order to be able to receive those uh, funds. If you get stuck in any way, shape or form in this process, reach out to your financial aid office. They are there to help and they want to make sure that they can provide you those funds that you're eligible for. So I talked about that washboard. This is what it looks like to create an account to apply for scholarships. And so this really vets scholarships to make sure that they are legitimate scholarships to help you apply for them. Uh, and so there's some really cool opportunities on there. Now, scholarships kind of come in seasons. So you may go on there right now and not see as many scholarships, but you may see the colleges that you're attending provide more institutional scholarships uh, right now. So you want to keep checking. It's not about like applying for financial aid where you apply for the FOSFOR WAFSA once for the year. Scholarships you're going to work on all throughout the year. I applied for scholarships every other weekend when I was in college and I was able to keep my debt from, uh, from undergraduate down to $3,000. That's all I owed on my entire bachelor's degree. And it was finding every piece of this puzzle to pay for college and using them all together to make sure I could fund my education. There's other scholarship uh, search engines as well. Our gearup.wa.gov page has scholarships as well as tools on how to apply for scholarships. So here are your next steps. You wanna explore your options. If you are sure, like you're like, I wanna to go to college, I don't even know what I wanna do. No worries. You wanna make sure you kinda of explore your options and deciding what your pathway is gonna be. You wanna make sure also to talk to your high school graduation, high school counselor to see if you're on track for graduation. If you are a Running Start student, you want to talk to the college advisor and your high school counselor to make sure you're on track for graduation. And if you're graduating with an associate's degree, that you're also um, making sure you're taking the classes you need, not just to get into admissions into the school you want to go to, but also to apply for your major, because that's something you typically do your junior year. And for students who are in Running Start who are receiving that associate's degree, uh, it becomes a process where you're applying for admissions and then also applying for your major at the same time. You want to determine which application application you're going to use. If you don't know today, I encourage you today to go to our website to assess yourself for either the FAFSA or the WASA. And then your first steps, which is creating an account with your FSA ID or creating a WASA account. So here's that college career compass that I talked about when you're trying to figure out your pathway. If you don't know what you want to do, totally fine. Or maybe you took an assessment last year and you're like, actually, I really love to do this. Don't worry. The things that you love and the careers that you're going to explore and your interests and passions, they are going to change throughout life. So you're always going to reassess to see, is this a career pathway that's going to meet my values and my interests and my needs for right now? And those will change from year to year. You know, what I wanted at 18 is different than what I want uh, right now. And so being able to also be flexible. Also, you may find that when you're in school, that you change your major. It's not the end of the world. Uh, I wish I could see everyone's hands go up when I always ask a room, how many you changed your majors? Uh, and there's a lot of them who did. I changed my major. And for me, it was the best decision because it allowed me to really go into a field I knew that was going to have longevity that I could stay in for a long time. We have college knowledge workbooks that you can, uh, you can either get from your high school counselors. Uh, we have uh, physical copies as well as virtual copies in English, Spanish, Vietnamese, Somali, and Russian. And this covers like ninth grade through, uh, through your senior year, everything you'd ever want to know about college. It's amazing. It's got a glossary in it. It's got um, just information in a way that students have designed. And then we also have the junior senior workbook. So this is the workbook through the 12th year campaign where the uh, college knowledge book is more informational. This is a workbook that you walk through that helps you uh, assess which kind of college you want to go to, helps you keep track of your applications for admissions and financial aid, and also how to understand the award letters uh, when you receive those. If you're a youth in care, if you've been in foster care um, at all in your life, I encourage you to utilize the fostering college knowledge trifold. This walks you through 6th through 12th grade, all the uh, resources you have, how to prepare, uh, pay, and explore uh, all your options for college. And then finally, we're here to help. We have a lot of resources. We love helping students. And we want to make sure that you have everything you need to get started on this new pathway after high school. And so we have resources on our website. We also have uh, resources that we put out on Twitter and on Facebook as well. And so I know we have some questions. So let's take a look and see, as I move this over, what questions we have. And Sam, I'll go ahead and have you unmute as well. 
if you are able to. So I'm looking at the Q&A. Okay. Oh, and a lot of them have been answered. Awesome. Yeah, I think there are only three left that just came in towards the tail end of your presentation. So if you want to grab those real quick and uh, clear those up. Yes, please keep your questions coming. Ed, um, we have our contact information. If you're like, I have a question, but I do not want to ask it to everybody, you can always email us if it's something that you don't want to ask in front of a whole group. So the first question I see here is the FAFSA app says the 2021-2022 application status uh, is currently, ah, okay. So what you want to do, it says it's currently unavailable with my uh, student aid app. Uh, and so what you want to do for that is first of all, check and see if there's an update for that. And if there isn't, it means they're working on it right now. So they've been fixing some bugs in the system, uh, specifically today. I know I was working on applications today and it would crash a couple times. I'm like, no, 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 stay up. Um, so it could also be that they are trying to fix some errors in the application. And if that's the case, then you can try logging back in tomorrow. Uh, but the first thing you wanna do is update the app on your phone. Okay, the second question I have is, do I apply for the WAFSA if I'm gonna attend an out-of-state school? So WAFSA funding uh, would be funding that would be used in Washington State. I encourage you to still, if you don't qualify for the FOSFA, to still apply for the WAFSA to see what your options are gonna be in state. Um, if you don't qualify for the FOSFA, then they typically, you're just gonna be using scholarships for out-of-state schools. So I encourage you just to see how many options are out there. Um, to make sure that, that you, you don't limit yourself from any of the opportunities that you may find in Washington State. Oh, um, okay, the next one. Uh, during my senior year, do I apply for the FOSFA and the WAFSA um, and loans and scholarships? You only apply for the FOSFA or the WAFSA, just one application. Uh, so what happens is you apply for the one that you qualify for, the FOSFA or the WAFSA, and then when you apply for the FOSFA, it's gonna consider you for the grants that we talked about and for loans. And scholarships you're gonna apply for separately. So the FOSFA will cover your loans and your loans and grants. The WAFSA will cover grants and the scholarships, those are gonna be separate applications. Um, okay. Ah, oh, good, a gap year question. Okay, if I'm gonna take a gap year after high school, would you use the 2019 or 2020 income information? If you're gonna take a gap year, awesome. I hope it's an amazing experience. Uh, what you wanna make sure you do is if you are especially a college bound student, I'd encourage you to apply for financial aid still this year, just in case you decide, you know what, um, I've already done what I want to do in my gap year. And now I want to go to school or I, I took a gap year and I traveled and I actually fell in love with a place that I want to live now. And now I want to go to school. So always apply for financial aid. Um, but you will do the application for the year that you're going to go to college. And so the biggest thing with a gap year, because a gap year is amazing, but it can turn into a gap decade real quick. You want to make sure that you have a game plan of how you're going to start college. So, uh, Specifically, you'll want to check with schools to see if you can apply for admissions and defer your enrollment. Uh, and then at a bare minimum, make sure that you have a spreadsheet. I'm a dork. I love spreadsheets. Just saying. You want to make sure you have a spreadsheet of the schools you want to go to and their admissions deadlines at a bare minimum so you don't miss any deadlines. I was going to clear these out. Okay. Um, how do grants work for two-year colleges? Amazingly well. I worked at a two-year college for 15 years, and so it works the same as it would work at any of the universities. They look at what is called your cost of attendance, which at a community college, the two-year schools, is going to be a little bit less, and so they look at that as part of the funding formula of how they're going to award aid. So it works the same as it would at a four-year school, uh, just it's that you're in a two-year program. Okay, the next one, are diversity ethnicity grants offered at all? I find a lot of scholarships. There are amazing scholarships, uh, especially if you are, I'm finding that um, if you're going into STEM fields right now, there are a lot of, so STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. There's a lot of funding out there too in those grants. When you go into the washboard, you can actually select that you're looking for grants based on diversity and ethnicity. Okay, uh, my parents are divorced. Will parents' income be submitted together? So if your parents are divorced, this is how it'll work. You will determine which parent you live with the most. So which parent you live with 51% or more of the time. So what will end up happening 
is you determine um, who is the parent based upon where you live. And then that's the parent that you provide the income from. So if you live, let's say with your mom, uh, then it's gonna be your mother's income. And if your mother's remarried, it's gonna be your mother and your step parent. For that question specifically, I also included the who's my parent infographic. So if you check the answers in the Q&A section and use that link, it provides a handy little infographic that can help you and your family kind of make that determination. Yes, I mean, that's the, the, so that thing will walk you through. You wanna make sure that you're using who, like we know your family is whoever you make your family. And so unfortunately for financial aid purposes, they're looking at biological parents. And so you wanna make sure you're not including other people in that, but using that chart to see whose income you should provide. Um, what do you mean when you say if you don't qualify for the FOSPA? So the FOSPA has some requirements, including uh, citizenship requirements that other students may not uh, be eligible for. But in Washington State, there are options through our state application for students who don't have citizen, citizenship status to receive aid. And so the cool thing in Washington is you can be undocumented to receive Washington State aid. I love that. It's one of my favorite things about Washington State. And so if you don't qualify for the FOSA, no problem. You're gonna see if you qualify for the WASA. Uh, real quick, one of the questions that was in the Q&A that for whatever reason just disappeared was asking, if I only use grant, if I plan to only use grants, do I need to apply for the FAFSA? And the answer to that is yes, in order to be considered for grants and your eligibility, you'll need to apply for financial aid to get that done. Yes, make sure like you always, you wanna apply for aid. If you want any of those, that gift aid, you wanna make sure you're applying for financial aid through the FOSFA, the WAFSA. And okay, seniors, oh, go ahead. I was What's just that? gonna mention too, um, you'll wanna to try to do it as early as possible also to maximize your aid opportunities. Um, so try to get it done ASAP. Yes. And we have workshops uh, all through December where you can come and attend for free and receive assistance in applying for financial aid. You wanna make sure, and your schools will also be offering opportunities too. So don't worry, you're not alone in applying. We, we make sure you, you're covered. Okay, uh, seniors should be applying for the 2021-2022 academic year. Yes, the 2020-2021 is this current year. So unless they are gonna like graduate mid-year, um, that's the only time I tell students who are seniors in high school to apply for the current year's application if they are going to graduate early. Um, let's see, during my senior year, do I apply for FOSPA and WAFSA? Oh, we already talked about that one. Yes, always your senior year and every year that you're gonna to go to college afterwards. So next year, you'll be just starting college, you're getting settled in, you're getting used to ramen, and then all of a sudden you're like, I gotta do this application again. So you wanna make sure that you apply every year you're going to school. Um, oh, uh, we're not sure what schools we wanna to apply to. Should we apply for the FOSPA now? Yes, you can put 10 schools on there. I highly encourage you, put anything that you're interested on there. If you're not sure, and you have like more than 10, start narrowing it down by personal choice. Also, always make sure that your school offers the major that you wanna to go towards. I had a student that they told me I got into my dream school. And in my mind, I thought dream school included, they have my major, it's located where I wanna go. So I was like, awesome, where are you going? University of Hawaii, and I'm like, that sounds amazing. And so the student called me after their first quarter. She was a little upset, she's like, Miss Winstead, I love this school, but it doesn't have my major. I went, wait, but you said it's your dream school. And she said, yeah. I was like, well, what were your criteria for selecting this school? And she's like, I need to be near a beach where it didn't rain a lot and the beach and the ocean, a beach. And I was like, okay, so it sounds like your top five are beach, um, but it didn't have your actual major. So the nice thing was we were able to get her transferred to a school near a beach that had her major, but man, it took that six months where she had to like figure out where she wanted to go, when she could have made sure that was included in the process. Ah, if you have twins going to college at the same time, congratulations, twin seniors, this is awesome. Probably the best year. And so what you wanna do is when you apply for financial aid, it's gonna ask about the parent's household size and the number of people in that household who are going to college. Make sure that in that calculation, you're including both your students so that they are considered, that you, their household being considered that two students are receiving uh, funding instead of one out of that household. And uh, uh, if uh, you're the parent 
and listening to this, when you fill out the first application, when the student gets to the end of the application and you sign as the parent, it's going to say, do you have any other students going to college? You're going to say yes, and it's going to import some of your information into your next student's application so you don't have to do all of it over again. Um, can we use, oh, this is a good one. Can we use financial aid for college and the high school class tuition? You can use it for college and the high school, but there are sometimes some waivers and other options. So you want to reach out to your high school counselor to see if there are waivers for your high school, uh, college and the high school classes. Oh, can you still apply even though you don't know what your major is going to be? Yes, of course. You can explore majors while going to school. I did that at the community college. I did my first two years at a community college and then transferred to the university when I truly knew what I wanted to do. No problem. You can explore and still work towards your degree. And I changed and get some twice while I twice. I did I did mine once, but also I used all my elective classes at the community college. You can still get a transfer degree. Uh, and you can have, you have 15 credits of what's called non-general ed electives. I took welding, automotive, and I took, um, oh, I took some other really, like, like, I just took a little bit of everything. So I was like, oh, I want to, oh, I want to know how to do this. And so for me, I was able to use all those towards my electives and still explore my pathway. I knew I was like, mm, I don't want to really work on cars. Welding, I mean, I'm okay at, but not the best. And I also, uh, like, I'm a little scared of, of anything sparky. So that was a good sign, like day one of the class. I was like, well, I'm definitely not going to be a welder because I'm, I just jump and I'm scared of all the things that may potentially hurt me. And so when you jump, you also accidentally, like, lose your torch. So I knew that wasn't going to be a pathway. And then I was able to, like, then decide, oh, I like psychology. This is cool. I'll take more classes in this and use my degree to help me explore. Christina, did we answer the question about um the standard testing with regards to scholarships, so SAT and ACT. So schools for admissions, a lot of them are going test optional, and so you also want to check with the school to see if they're still requiring an SAT for those scholarships. Um, so you, some of the schools are saying, yeah, we're not going to consider SATs for that scholarship. Some scholarship committees are doing the same thing. So you just want to check with the individual school or scholarship to see if they've added or removed that requirement. That's a good uh, question. I think additionally, when you're using websites like um, Washboard or FastWeb or any of the scholarship junkies, any of those kinds of websites, as you read through scholarship descriptions and requirements, they'll tell you whether or not they require tests and everything like that. On top of that, I think a lot of especially local scholarship providers are going to understand that there are different circumstances for this academic year. So you'll want to double check with the scholarship providers to see if they're making any exceptions to the requirement of testing. Okay, let's see what other ones we have. Oh, we have a couple more. Um, let's see here. Oh, if you were to study college uh, for two years and were to study abroad, how would financial aid work? So sometimes financial aid will work where the financial aid may be able to cover your study abroad tuition because it's a program through that school and you're receiving credits from the college you're going to. But typically you'll want to apply for scholarships to cover room and board in your flight. The other thing you want to check out is to make sure in times of COVID, there may be restrictions on travel. And so you just want to be very mindful about restrictions that may occur. And so it may mean that like, oh, I might not be doing study abroad this year, but maybe I'm going to put it off to next year. And there's some really cool options at the community colleges and the universities. Some of the programs can be as little as three weeks, and some of them can be up to six months. I had a student that just kept saying, well, I'm just going to do the next one in Spain. I'm like, you actually just moved to Spain because this is your third time in a row that you're doing study abroad and you never came home. <laughs> You came home just to renew your visa and that was it. So sometimes you even fall in love with the country that you went to. Um, do I sign up for college bound when I'm in eighth grade? Yes, seventh or eighth grade, you can sign up for college bound if you're eligible. Definitely. Um, let's see here. Should you sign up for ASAP for college bound when you're in eighth grade still? Um, yes, yeah, so while you're, if you're in eighth grade right now, Definitely sign up for College Bound. Um, oh, uh, do you recommend going to college first or university? It's about your individual pathway. For me, the two-year college was the best fit for me to save money, stay close to home, and decide what I was going to do before transferring to a university. And so for me, it was a great fit. It's all about what's the best fit for you as an individual. Uh, my daughter's attending university in Canada, freshman. She'd still like to apply for the FOSFA this year. 
uh, or does that help for out of country school tuition? It depends on the university and if it's affiliated, it depends on the affiliation. Typically it's for schools in the US though, but I've had some schools that are actually affiliated with a university of the United States and it's some sort of like sister campus. So typically if it's not listed on the FAFSA, so when you go in to apply, they'll have a list of schools. If it's not on that list, typically it's not eligible for those funds. I would also encourage you guys to do the FAFSA for her just in case plans in Canada don't work out and she needs to look at any options within the United States. Having that door open still by applying is always a great thing to kind of have in your back pocket. Yes, definitely. Um, also, checking with the college she's going to to see if they, if they don't offer aid uh, and they're considered like an international student from coming from the US to see if they have any specific scholarships to help offset the cost for international students. Um, my daughter wants to study abroad. Awesome. Best time in their life to go study abroad. Like, don't have a whole lot that you're really responsible for. It's the best time to go. Uh, which financial aid vehicles should we use to pay for room, board, and other expenses? Scholarships. I would definitely apply for scholarships and some schools will even have a list of just scholarships for study abroad to help pay for those extra expenses. Most universities are also going to have study abroad specific offices that can give you more information about how it works with their schools and institutions specifically. Some of them will use some of the financial aid funds, others rely heavily on scholarships. So it's really institution specific too. So I would say do a little bit more homework um, at the schools that you're interested in. Uh, okay, I have a daughter in ninth grade. Is college bound too late to sign up for? What was the extended deadline? Can you remember Sam? Sam's gonna look that up. We've got Otter on it. <laughs> and I'll answer another question in the meantime. Are there other programs like college bound for students that were very college bound but didn't apply for it when they're in seventh or eighth grade? The Washington College Grant income levels uh, will help families uh, that may have met the income requirements of college bound but didn't apply receive some of those funds through the Washington College Grant. So you're going to want to make sure you apply for FOSFOR WASA. Um, okay, uh, with filling up financial aid, would changing majors four to six times be an issue in the latter run? So you want to make sure when you're changing majors, typically you have to fill out paperwork with your college. And part of that is them assessing how many credits you've taken towards your degree um, and making sure that it, you still have enough room in your financial aid to, to change to another program. So whenever you change your major, you want to make sure you're checking with your financial aid office and your admissions office as well. Um, what is the college bound income requirement? Uh, it depends on the number of people in your family. So there's a, it's a scale depending on the number of people in your family and, and the income that you have. Um, will college bound, oops, the question jumped. Okay. Will college bound scholarship not work if we took a gap year after high school? You can take a gap year, but just one gap year. And then you have to make sure you're enrolled, admitted to and enrolled at a college within one year of graduation. Um, the extension for ninth grade signups is to November 30th of this year, so November 30th, 2020. Ah, so your daughter in ninth grade, you can have them apply for college bound, just make sure you do it as soon as possible. And you have to get them through the application process before that date, not after. Um, it isn't one of those you can start it and finish it after, you have to have it all done before November 30th, so just keep that in mind too. Perfect. And then a subsidized loans are loans that the government subsidizes the interest on while you're going to school and for a short period afterwards. Okay, how do you get sports scholarships? Okay, sports scholarships are hard. It's one of those things that I have a lot of students say, well, I'm going to get a full ride into a sports program. And if you do, awesome. I am so excited for you. But a lot of students don't have that opportunity. Uh, they get partial scholarships. So you want to make sure that you are applying for other scholarships in addition to your sports scholarships. So if you have schools that are uh, kind of recruiting you to play sports, you want to see what they're going to be offering. What financially, it's all a puzzle. What financially can offer you, what they can offer you in scholarships, and other types of scholarships to help supplement it. But I have still, to this day, not met a single student who's had a full ride um, from a sports scholarship. And so I just want to make sure you're aware that that can be really challenging, uh, especially if you're in a walk-on role. Um, okay, I think... Um, oh, do schools give sports arts scholarships in addition? Yes, in addition to academic, there's arts ones where sometimes you have to uh, 
show the work that you've done in a portfolio or, or play a piece of music that you sight read, that they send you the music and you open it up on camera and you play it. Uh, there are also sports scholarships as well. So there's different ones based upon the program you're going towards, based upon your interests, but also based upon your academics. You want to apply for all of them. Collect them all like Pokemon. <laughs> I think in addition to the sports scholarship question, uh, they are very rare. I think the best thing you can do is reach out to the coaches because they're not allowed to talk to student athletes within a certain window of time because of NCAA and NAIA requirements. But if you reach out to them, they can respond to you with very general direct statements. So if you do ask, you know, what is the likelihood of me getting a scholarship or is there an opportunity for me to walk on, they can provide you with more clear information about what their circumstances is what their circumstances are for the team and how much scholarship dollars that they may have left and what the likelihood is that you would be able to earn one or what you would need to do to earn one so um, again kind of ball in your court check with the specific institution and specific teams for a more clear picture of what that looks like too